right to Ohio now in the case, the really terrible, tragic case of a babysitter accused in the death of a three-year-old toddler. Lindsay Parton, 36 years old, was charged with involuntary manslaughter and three counts of child endangerment. The verdict, and in addition to the murder charge, the verdict came down last week. Guilty on all counts. Lindsay Parton's sentencing date will be in May. Now, what made this case particularly interesting was the fact that this child, little Hannah, three years, three years old, collapsed not even two minutes before, uh, after I should say, her father dropped her off at the babysitter's house. So there were really a lot of questions here as to what caused her death. Not what so much as to who? Could it have been the father? That's what the defense was trying to point. That's who the defense was trying to point the finger at. But I think there was some pretty damning testimony, and that came from the defendant herself, Lindsay Parton, in the form of an interview she did with police and the fact she took the stand. And when she was interviewed by police and when she took the stand, she admitted to harming this child in the days leading up to the death. The defendant, Lindsay Parton, admitting to shaking this child, hitting this child. Uh, it's quite shocking to hear. Uh, but again, she's not talking about the actual day where this f child collapsed, Jason. She's talking about the days leading up. First of all, a couple of things I want you to comment on. One being, you know, this you were able to watch a brief clip of the police interview. Do you think the detectives did a good job here, and do you think that Lindsay said anything that really hurt her case? Uh, I think the detectives did do a good job. I commented on this previously when we watched this at another time because the detectives are sort of leading her down a path and then letting her finish the race almost, as I, I call the passing of the baton, because it's her own words. She's not just saying yes, no to their questions. She's filling in and giving great detail to the detectives. So they were very effective because the whole purpose is to get somebody talking. And you yep. never know what's going to come out of their mouth. So they were very good about that. And I think it did hurt her ultimately. It had to have. Um, because she, although it's, 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 she lost any potential sympathy that she might have. She, she's describing what she did. Uh, some people might say, well, it's nothing different than a lot of parents or a lot of child uh, caregivers uh, do. However, I think she lost any potential sympathy that she might have had, which eliminated the possibility of doubt, I think, in the jury's minds. Back to Ohio now in that case against a babysitter accused of murdering a three-year-old little girl that she was supposed to be caring for. The day of the death of Hannah Weshi, her father, Jason Weshi, dropped her off at the babysitter Lindsay Parton's house. And about a minute and a half after she was dropped off, she collapsed and went into this medical emergency that ultimately led to her death. A tough cross-examination of Jason Weshi, who is the father of that three-year-old little girl who was killed. Now let's listen to Lindsay Parton, the defendant herself. She's also under cross-examination by prosecutors. And remember, as part of her witness statements while she's on the stand, she admits to hurting that child. There's the cross-examination of the defendant, Lindsay Parton. And I think uh, Jason and Ashley will agree with me. She did a pretty effective job uh, in this cross-examination. Uh, definitely. I mean, right away, she got the witness to admit that she lied. Right. I mean, that's a pretty, you know, watershed moment in any cross-examination. And so, you know, later on, you're going to be arguing, you know, where, where the lines are blurred. The witness wants you to believe, well, I was lying then, but I'm telling the truth now. And it's a very, very difficult thing for a jury to accept. Once they're convinced, uh, and she's admitting that she lied, once the a witness is admitting to lying... They become it, a liar. A liar branded that way, and it's very, very hard to recover your credibility in any sense uh, in front of a jury. A very tragic but fascinating case because they did get a conviction based on a kind of murky cause. Would you agree, Jason? I, I, to some extent, yes, but you know, we're talking about the credibility of the witness and that's all very important. But at the end of the day, the prosecutor has the burden of proof medically to show the causal connection that we've been talking about. And I know they had a very well-credentialed pedi pediatric expert that testified in very great detail and connected all those dots that we're talking about on the what we call causation between the actual conduct of the defendant and the cause on the victim here, the three-year-old. And 
whether the jury could have gone either way on that, obviously uh, they were swayed enough by that testimony. I assume that the defense attorneys of the defendant also put on uh, their own expert probably to try to refute they that. Uh, ultimately, we know that the jury uh, believed the prosecution side and not the defense side. Why did you find that medical testimony so important? It, it's crucial because it, as lay people, we can't make those determinations and those conclusions. So it's, it's a requirement under the law, of course, uh, and also common sense wise that you need a medical professional. If as a lay person say, ah, that, that, that conduct can never cause that kind of injury, but from the medical person can slowly, methodically, hopefully in a very uh, cogent way, be able to explain that medically, what happens to the body and how these actions can result in somebody's death. In other words, that it would have taken a long time for her to get to a point where she collapsed. So it would make sense if she was injured the day before that she collapsed the next morning, just a minute and a half after And that's very off. common with, you know, bleeding on the brain or various different traumatic in injuries. You don't always, uh, you know, collapse sort of right on the spot. Sometimes it does have a buildup of a matter of days or even hours. Okay. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, and we have breaking news to report. Remember last hour I told you that the prosecutors were going to release the Robert Kraft surveillance videos from inside that spot in Florida? Well, just moments ago, literally, uh, a judge blocked the release of the spa videos until a hearing is held. A hearing on the motion for that protective order has been scheduled for April 29th. So originally we heard prosecutors were going to release this video in the next day or two based on the strength of the public records law in Florida. Now a judge said, not so fast. Uh, we need to review these constitutional issues before we allow the prosecution to go forward with this. What do you think, Jason? I mean, I know you, you don't practice law in Florida, and Florida's open records laws are quite expansive, especially compared to, like, New York laws. Right. Um, but at the end of the day here, do you think that the judge is going to allow these tapes to come out? I don't know. It's a really <laughs> great question. I wish I had my crystal ball yes, and, and can yes. answer that. I, I think at the end of the day, from what I know about the statute, I think the judge will allow that. And I think what the judge is doing now is, uh, as Judge Wilcott said, is almost, you know, buying a little more time, want to button up a little bit more, hear a little bit more robust arguments, uh, perhaps some other evidence, uh, so that a more thorough, thoughtful decision can be made. Speaking of arguments, both sides were in court today arguing, not today, I'm sorry, earlier this week, arguing about this very issue. Uh, Robert Kraft's attorneys trying to make the case to keep these videos out of public view. They amounted, they basically compared the videos to pornography. Let's listen to a bit more of Robert Kraft's attorneys making their case to the judge. <music> Another major case that we've been covering, a case against John Johnchuk out of Florida. Another tragic case, this time a father accused of murdering his five-year-old daughter, Phoebe Johnchuk, by throwing her off the bridge. The question in this case was, was he insane? Did he uh, meet the legal definition of insanity? And this is a case that comes down to the jurors having to decide whether or not he met the legal definition of insanity. I want to bring in my panel right now. Let's talk about this case, because I know you've been following it as well. Yes. Um, we had a guilty verdict. Were you surprised by that? I was not surprised about that at all. Keep in mind, this is a case not about, you know, what happened. The facts of the case are, un, are not in dispute, unlike the Lindsay Parton case is a, a, a whole different set of facts here. It was really about the state of mind and the mental capacity of the defendant at the time. So it's, in a way, it's a really, really narrow issue. Uh, as you know, uh, that burden to show uh, not guilty by reason of insanity, very, very high burden. Uh, and from what I saw, I think the jury got it right. All right. So as we continue to take a little bit of a dive into this case, because it was a very interesting one that did garner some public attention, let's take a look at the prosecution's closing arguments. How did they try to convince the jurors that this guy knew exactly what he was doing when he pulled up to that bridge that evening and took his five-year-old daughter out of the back seat of the car and threw her over the bridge? Here, the prosecution trying to convince the jurors that, listen, you know what, this guy had some mental health issues, clearly, but it didn't raise to the level that he did not know 
what he was doing that day. And one of the things they pointed to, Jason, was the fact that he fled the scene right after he threw the child off the bridge. Right. That's really, really important here because it has to do with whether you know the consequences of your actions. It has to know whether, uh, it has to do with whether you know right from wrong. And that's evidence that you are aware of the repercussions of your actions. You, you flee when you know you do something wrong. And that's a really crucial, uh, you know, if he was just walking around in yep. a daze there afterwards and, 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 and was babbling, uh, they would try to use that in support of an insanity defense. Or correctly, though, the prosecution's pointing out very methodical uh, actions on behalf of the defendant uh, that would fly in the face of an insanity defense. Of course, the prosecution's counter to this defense is that, no, he was malingering. He was faking these symptoms because he was trying to act like he was insane. It, that's a, an argument that's you know frequently made. Obviously, I think the key also is the the length of time. So really, what's important about the insanity defense is what was going on at that moment when the crime was committed, and you know what happened when he got booked into the jail and when he saw the the counselor in the jail. Um, I don't want to dismiss it out of hand, but that that's already after the fact, and he could be tailoring uh, his his answers and things like that. He's been in therapy. He knows a lot of the buzzwords and, 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 and things like that and how to say certain things. So uh, he could be doing that. But even if he truly was having a psychotic episode at that time, meaning after the fact, it doesn't mean that at the time he acted, he did not know the consequences of his actions and did not know right from wrong. That still remains the key. I was a little underwhelmed by this. I think jurors are reluctant to buy insanity defenses because they see it as an excuse for conduct. Would you agree? I definitely agree on that. And you notice the defense attorney, one of the things that she tried to hook onto was she said, well, nothing else makes sense. You know, in other words, why would somebody do this? But as Judge Wilcock points out, there's a lot of crazy things that people do, uh, horrific things that people do to others, to their own children, and we don't always have an answer. So just because, oh, why else would he do that? I think that's a pretty weak argument uh, to be making. All right, Jason Friedman, what do you make of what this officer says happened right after the alleged crime? Yeah, he's a good witness, isn't he? I he's thought a he great was, witness. Yeah, I thought he was yes. very credible, very measured, uh, very methodical, uh, speaking a nice, even uh, keel. And I thought what he said made you know, perfect sense. He's just recounting facts as he remembers them. Uh, but it's really key because, again, it has to do with the state of mind and what the defendant appreciated about his actions uh, at the time. What somebody, do you make of it? Did yeah, he well, appreciate somebody, his actions? Definitely. Somebody Somebody who's holding onto a steering wheel doesn't want to follow commands of a police officer that doesn't want to get extracted from a vehicle because you know you did something wrong. You're in big trouble. And I think that's uh, evidence that the prosecution used to, to further argue their point that, again, he knew what he did was wrong. He could appreciate the consequences of his actions. Woman was most likely called as a defense expert because she has some pretty strong. Uh, credible testimony that this guy was saying some pretty whacked out things right after this happened. Right. I mean, you notice. <laughs> Sorry the, for you, my crudeness. Yeah, no, but, but the, that yeah, is. the other officer was sort of painting one picture about the defendant, you know, just sort of not wanting to get out, really didn't talk about anything that was coming out of his mouth at that point. Yes. Now you have this officer picking up the story and painting a whole different picture about what they're going to try to argue really went to his state of mind. Again, that's what's at issue in this case. And so clearly that's why the defense, you know, called this witness to sort of complete the story a little bit more for the jury and also setting up the argument uh, for the insanity uh, defense because his, the defendant's own words at the time. People were saying, oh, I'm God, take me to right. Babylon. You know, not somebody they're going to argue in their right mind. Uh, but again, you can think you're God and still know what you're doing is wrong. I thought it was pretty strong testimony that something is off about this guy. If he's acting like this, the moments, minutes after he threw his daughter off a bridge. Right. And, and that's, listen, we have an issue in our criminal justice system. I mean, you can't, you know, he did something horrific. It's undisputed. Right. And the idea of, you know, so-called letting somebody off, uh, it, it, it doesn't sit well with us as a society. And it has to be a very, very high burden. I agree with that to try to get exonerated, you know, based upon uh, insanity. Now, he has mental problems. Everyone knows that. And that could be a factor in, you know, sentencing or any services that he would get. But the idea of uh, making it easy, you know, to get out of a crime that you knowingly or admittedly committed uh, because you're claiming you didn't know right from wrong, didn't know the consequences of your actions, that's a really dangerous thing. It's a high thing. bar. And listen, it should, be. it should be because we need justice, right? And we can't let defendants off the hook merely because they claim they were insane at the time. There has to be real proof of that. And in this case, the jurors did not buy the argument that this man you see on your screen here was insane 
at the time. Uh, and they convicted him. And I think both of my panelists will agree that that was probably a good decision. So here these doctors are talking about these experts, medical experts, talking about getting someone to competency. It seems kind of elusive, but that is possible to meet the legal definition of competency. A absolutely. And just to be clear with the viewers, that's a collateral issue as to whether or not what his state of mind was at the time the exactly. crime was committed. So they had to take a pause in this trial because he was unable to allegedly either help his defense team understand the proceedings that were going on around him. And so then he's deemed incompetent. Uh, you need and to that's why they had to work with him to get him competent. Exactly. And when they say right. getting him competent, it means getting him to a place where he can understand the charges being brought against him. He can participate in his own defense, uh, have some rudimentary understanding of, of sort of what's going on. He's not in the middle or in the throes of, you know, massive psychotic episode where he just has no idea what's going around on around him. All right. I had a great panel today, Ashley Wilcott and Jason Freeman. You Thank guys you. are sticking around because yes. uh, Aaron Keller is going to be back in just a few minutes with the Daily Debrief. And let me tell you, he has a lot going on between the case against Robert Kraft, the case or the drop case against Jesse Smollett. Lots going on. He's going to bring you on the Daily Debrief. So you're definitely going to want to stick around for that. Thanks for being with me this afternoon. We'll be back in a few minutes.